What's up guys and welcome back to Moaning. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here because you want to wrap up the Aeneid. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be discussing Book 11 of Virgil's Aeneid. If I could summarize Book 11 into a one sentence it would just be that Camilla finally makes her back debut only to die 400 lines later. I wish I was lying. That is genuinely what happens in this book. She's a really, really powerful character. She's a perfect example of a powerful female character who is written into antiquity. Um, she unfortunately has like a really stupid death. We'll get into that when we get to it. But with all that being said, why don't we just roll into the narrative to finally bring you guys Camilla and to bring you up to speed with uh, the Aeneid. So the book opens and it is now the next day and Aeneas gets up in front of all of his men. And in fact, he opens the whole book by picking up the, uh, the belt, right? So he had killed some guy in the last book called Mazentius. He hung onto his belt and he now picks it up in front of the rest of the Trojans and he's like, this is the belt of the great hero Mazentius. I killed him because I'm amazing. After he gasses himself up a little bit and the rest of the army is like, oh yeah, go Aeneas. He does announce that today he doesn't actually want to fight, that he wants to honor the dead men of their own army. So he tells everybody that they are just going to be burying people. They're going to be burning people. Like they want to be, that sounds really dark, but like that's what they would have done in the ancient world if you were not up to speed thus far with how they would have handled that, that um, that is the normal and respectful way to deal with the dead in the ancient world. And so he just says that today uh, they are going to try and do that, basically. However, before they get started on that, Aeneas announces that they should prioritize sending Pallas back to his father, Evander, because Pallas is dead. If you guys weren't here for last book, if you guys don't know what's happened, Pallas was killed by Turnus. And so now they have to send uh, him back to his father, Evander. Everybody agrees with the sentiment. They all cheer on Aeneas. And so then they all, as a collective group, as a collective squadron, they all all head to where Pallas's body is being kept and when they all get to the threshold of the door you know they all go to see the body and how peaceful it is it is actually being watched by this guy called Akoetes how would one pronounce this is a c o e t e s that is how you spell this guy's name it's not really that important because this is the only time we see him this is the only moment of importance but he uh, is kept to watch over Pallas and that's because once upon a time he was actually the armor bearer of Evander. I, I didn't know that was a role until reading this book. However, he was the armor bearer. And now because he's too old, he was then set in charge of just like watching over Pallas and taking care of him, which obviously didn't do anything for Pallas in battle the other day, but whatever. When everybody enters this room though, you've got Echo Eates, whatever the his name is looking over the body everybody's in there we then have the trojan women who start to do the whole you know weeping thing they're wailing they're tearing at their hair exactly how we expect them to react they want to do the whole like mourning thing and aeneas makes a speech where he says uh, that all of them are going to clean the body so that they can send Pallas back to evander uh, in the cleanest most respectful way possible everybody is sad everybody is crying all of the trojans are like beating their breasts they are all doing the women wailing thing sort of shebang because we're supposed to see how awful this death is that Pallas died and that they have to send the body back and so as they're all wailing aeneas actually he decides that a thousand men are going to go with Pallas's body in order to ensure that evander uh, gets the respect that he deserves now that his son is dead so he organizes a thousand men to ride with the body the other men who are not going to be riding with the body they are quick to start making these like like, a, um, like couches, so they're gonna start making those. And Aeneas himself in this moment uh, takes it upon himself to go and find these two robes that actually Dido had given him, which is like, oh. But anyway, so Dido gives him these two robes, which are like gold and purple, and he now gives one to Pallas and he puts one of them over uh, the body as the women are cleaning him and making sure that, you know, there's not like a speck of blood, that he, um, that, you know, he's like perfect in death as well and he's really honored in his death. So the thousand men that are then going to ride with Pallas start getting everything else ready, right? So we've got chariots getting ready to put the body on. We've got also um, Pallas's war horse as well is part of the procession. Some of his weapons are also part of the procession because not all of his armor was on him. I remember that Turnus took a lot of his armor and so therefore what they do have of Pallas's armor goes as part of this procession. And also, do we remember the captives? Like a weird moment where Aeneas is like, I'm gonna take all these human captives and I'm gonna kill them blah, 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 in order to honor Pallas. All of that sort of weird shit. So they're there as well as part of this whole <laughs> procession. <laughs> that just sounded really weird. It's because it is weird. It makes sense for Achilles. It doesn't really make all that much sense for Aeneas to do. But anyways, they're part of it as as well anywho so they are sent off now and Aeneas makes a little speech to the rest of the Trojans who remain uh, where they are in this plot of land 
And he basically says that Palace's fate is all of their fate, and so therefore they need to uh, really stick to understanding the defense of the walls, defense of their people, and get back to thinking war strategy-wise, whilst all of them go to handle King Evander, and so on and so forth, and yeah. Basically, he says, now we've got to figure out how to defend ourselves, let's also bury the people that we said we were going to bury, now the palace is off, great, we've got this whole plan for the rest of the day, go. When they all sort of pan out to go and do their various things, whether it's gathering bodies, whether it's figuring out if the fortifications are as strong as they should be, that actually there are some Latin envoys that are sent to the Trojans. So they meet with Aeneas and they come bearing these olive branches that are wrapped in wool, right, in, in honor of peace and all of this. And they come to him and they ask him, they ask Aeneas, for some days to bury their own dead, right? So this should actually mirror, if you guys are familiar with the Iliad, there was a break uh, in the battle in order to honor dead, and it's because both parties really wanted to do that, and the same thing happened. So Aeneas, much like in the Iliad, uh, he honors this 100%, and he's very pious, you know, obviously pious Aeneas, that is a little epithet. So he honors them, and he sends the bag, and he says, you know, of course, they have this little chat, and they decide together that it's gonna be 12 days of burying their own dead, and then moving forward with the battle after that. He says specifically to the envoys, of course I honor you and your wish to bury your dead. This is not your fault. This is not their fault. This is your king's fault for abandoning our agreement and our friendship. And it's more importantly, Turnus's fault for constantly seeking out this fight. So of course you can have all the time, but 12 days is what we agreed. So um, I will expect to resume battle in 12 days. However, you can have all the time within those 12 days that you need to bury the dead so that we can bury our dead as well. The envoys are super impressed with Aeneas' piety, and so then they go back to the Latins, and Aeneas resumes his work by gathering up the bodies and, and all of this. And our narrative now switches to Rumor, who does nothing good in this whole book. Rumor personified goes straight to Evander and actually uh, beats the news to Evander before his son actually makes it to him. So now Evander is overcome by grief as he looks out onto the plains and can suddenly see the thousand men approaching, and he knows what they are approaching with. Virgil tells us that there is no power in this earth that could control Evander's pain. And in fact, Evander says a really sad line, I had to write it down, which I found so sad that when he's seeing the body of Pallas come towards him, he says, a father should not survive his son. And that is genuinely one of the most heartbreaking things I have ever read to hear Evander like calling out the body of his dead son coming and being like, this is not how the earth should be ordered, how the world should be ordered, how society should be ordered. And you're like, ah! It is just like the harsh realities of war that really come out in that in that one line. And it's really beautifully said by Evander. But anyways, I'm just fangirling about that line in the Latin. The rest of the sentiment of Evander's speech, though following that line, is that uh, he doesn't blame the Trojans and all he wants to do is to see Turnus die. And that is his only wish, that he wants Turnus to be avenged um, for the death. Well, he wants his son's death to be avenged. I think that's the correct sentence. But either way, he wants Turnus to die in payment for Pallas' body being delivered back to him in such a way. Where the story cuts to now is where my realms of summarizing are gonna do me wondrously good. And that is because we have about two pages of hearing about the Latins bearing some people and the Trojans bearing some people. But that's all you need to know. So I'm not gonna tell you who's bearing, I'm gonna tell you how there's just absolutely no point, but it's about two pages of just like different burials and how they're honoring the dead. All you need to know is that they both do it. And smack bang sort of in the middle of these 12 days, so probably around, you know, day six, around there, you know, Virgil doesn't tell us exactly day six, but he does say around the middle of this period of time, that the envoys, do we remember when the Latins had sent envoys to Diomedes, like the hero, like the love of my life from the Trojan War, right? So like they sent envoys to him to ask for help. Well, those envoys now have come back and they approach uh, into the Latin uh, camp. They go into the Latin city, actually not the camp, but they go into the city and they say, yes, so Diomedes, said no. Which obviously when they're presenting this to a whole room of Latins, including the king, Latinus, including Turnus and all of these people, they're saying, you know what, we asked this great hero who would probably have helped us. We brought him all of this gold, all of these gifts. He said no. The entire room is like, well now what? In fact, all of them have such little faith that they're going to win the war because they see how powerful Aeneas was. In fact, there's one of the envoys whose name you don't need to know, but one of the envoys does highlight how amazing Aeneas was in battle. How amazing, you know, they heard about him in the Trojan War and, and all of this amazing stuff about him just kind of being like, look, there is no way that we can win this. What I suggest that we do is actually all of the gifts that we were just going to give to Diomedes, let's just give them to Aeneas. Let's just call a truce, give him all of the gifts. He should be happy. Call it a day, huh? Latinus, the king, 
also echoes this sentiment. He says to the room, I agree that we should do that. And also on top of that, I know that there's a plot of land that I think I could give to Aeneas if he's willing to take it. I wish that I had just come to him and just been friendly and just agreed to, you know, have him marry Lavinia just straight away. We would have avoided so much trouble here. But unfortunately I didn't. So maybe he'll take this plot of land. And when Latinus has sort of finished his speech, we have this guy stand up who's called Drances. And I'm laughing because this guy, hates Turnus. Like literally hates him so much. He's popped up a little bit before in this book, but now is really his time to shine. He stands up in front of this whole room of Latins and goes, Latinus, you have made perfect sense. We all agree with you. This is not your fault though. This is not our fault. This is not anybody's fault in this room apart from Turnus. This is all your fault, man. In fact, he goes so far to say, you know what, Turnus, if you are so hell-bent set on getting this palace as a dowry in order to marry Lavinia, you go out and fight Aeneas. Stop taking all of us with you. It's you, man to man, one on one, go and handle it. Now, obviously, Drances is like a massive hothead, if you can't tell, and he is instigating a fight with Turnus, who we also know, in order for him to be so great on the battlefield, also a hothead. So Turnus, hearing this, not happy. In fact, he is described as blazing like a violent rage in his response. And he says a really, really long response, which I'm obviously going to summarize for you because the main thing that Turner says is, you say I'm defeated and I'm at fault for all of this because I'm weak-willed. You say all of this bad stuff about me. What about all of those bodies I killed? What about the fact that I am the one who's leading everybody out into fighting and I'm the one who killed so many Trojans that I clogged up the river Tiber? Do we remember that, Drancis? But if you insist, if you all insist, fine, Drancis is in such a bad mood, I will go and face Aeneas and I'll go do that by myself. If he wants to fight me man to man, one on one, I can do it without armor made by Vulcan. Which, <laughs> spoiler here, um, he can't. He fails miserably in the next book. But that's not the point of this book. Let's just get back to book 11. As they continue to bicker like children in this room in the palace, that actually a messenger interrupts them. A messenger comes in and he sort of stands in the middle of them and yells, whatever's going on, we need to stop because Aeneas and all of the Etruscans, all of the Trojans, all of his allies, they are now advancing on us in battle formation. So we best get ready. And the announcement causes Turnus to really get his together and he starts ordering everybody around to go into different formations and different squadrons in order to uh, best defend the city. As everybody is moving out into their various roles, Latinus actually goes back to his chambers because he feels so guilty uh, for being the cause of this because he feels like even though everybody blames Turnus and his pride, that he feels like if only he had told Turnus not to do anything, if only he had really uh, come into play and really, really accepted Aeneas as his son-in-law, which he knew, you know, he knew that that was what he had to do. He had been told his whole life that was what he wanted to do. But uh, if only he had done that, then this wouldn't have caused such a big war and so many deaths. So he feels really bad. And when he's going into his chambers that actually his wife, Amata, and his daughter Lavinia are going to make sacrifices to Minerva um, at the same time. So we have this movement going on of people who feel guilty for kind of, you know, causing the war, but not actively taking a part in the war. So that is where we leave the family. And then we move out to uh, figure out who is in charge of what. And the most important person who we meet right now in the narrative is Camilla. So Camilla is leader of the Volscians. They are spelt like this, right? So those are the people who come behind her. And the first time we meet her, she actually walks out to meet Turnus. And when she walks out to meet Turnus, she's on her horse. Her horse is walking to meet Turnus. And uh, she then pulls up and she stops next to him. She gets off her horse and all of her army do the exact same thing, that they pull up their horses, they then stop and get off. They dismount in the exact same way that Camilla does, which shows the incredible leadership that this woman has, that her whole army just mirror her exactly. Camilla goes to address Turnus and she says, I don't know what your plans are for today, Turnus. However, if you want us, if you want me and you want my warriors to go in and to see what Aeneas is made of, to see what his army are made of, we will go out first and we will come back and report exactly what we have to handle out on the battlefield. If you would like us to do that, we are more than happy to lead the way. What a brave moment! This woman is offering to go up as basically a guinea pig in front of all of the Trojans. She's like, don't worry, I got this. And we must for that alone, for the dismounting, for that alone, you gotta just, just round of applause for Camilla. I love it. Turnus actually tells her that there's no need for her to do that because Turnus has a plan of his own, that he wants Camilla to guard the city whilst he himself, and I had to write this down because this is like the weirdest way of presenting an attack. He says, don't worry, I'm planning an ambush where there is a sunken path through the wood. Right, so that is, he's basically planning to ambush Aeneas in the woods. But I just love the directions he gives Camilla. Like, oh, do we remember this, this little sunken path? I wonder if Camilla's like, 
What? Because I feel like anybody would say that. I presume there are lots of sunken paths in the woods. But either way, that's what he tells Camilla. And because Camilla is so smart and she's so like, you know, war oriented and all of this, she's like, yes, Turnus, I know exactly what you mean. Go ahead, go ambush uh, Aeneas and all of this. I will handle the fort. Now, the next 400 lines are Camilla's life story and her most important moments in battle, where we see her kill a bunch of people. And we also hear, again, we hear her entire life story. So we hear how she actually grew up in the wilderness um, and how she is, you know, destined to be this great warrior and have this great moment, but she's also destined to die. And in fact, we hear that Diana, the goddess Diana, who is Artemis in Greece, she is watching over Camilla as she's on the battlefield because Camilla has sworn her life to serve Diana. I am not gonna go into too much detail though about Camilla. I know that I built her up at the start of this episode and you're probably all like, wait, what? However, I've already done a massive deep dive into her character on this channel. So I will be linking that video, whichever corner it should pop up in. That is where I go into and I quote parts of her and I say how great that she was in battle. And I tell you like play by play what happens with Camilla in a really, long-winded way for lack of a better word, but that is what I go into in that video. And what you need to know for this video is that again, you hear her whole life story, you hear these great moments of her on the battlefield, you hear how she's leading her army in, she's super brave, she's super great, and then she dies, and she dies in the stupidest way that's written down. I do want to give a moment and say that with Camilla, there's a lot of analysis, but again, you know, I'm not supposed to be analyzing these videos, I'm supposed to be summarizing for you guys, and what's important to know about Camilla's character is that storyline-wise, just like if we take out the whole analysis part of her character, it's genuinely dumb how she dies, and that's because this great warrior queen, right? This warrior princess on the battlefield. She's been an absolute beast. This woman is supposedly the woman that Virgil writes to stand in the middle of the battlefield, and then she gets distracted by someone's shiny armor like a fucking magpie, and you're reading it like, what? It is the most frustrating thing. And again, there is, there is analysis for that, and it's about, you know, what Rome stands for and all of this, and it's great and that's wonderful, but in order to have a female character suffer in this way, because, oh, you know, there's a shiny thing and she gets distracted and then all of a sudden someone shoots her in the rib, you know, with a bow. With a bow? With an arrow, even. <laughs> well, I guess with a bow. But somebody shoots from their bow an arrow and it lodges into Camilla's rib cage and then she falls over and she dies. And you're just like, oh! It's so frustrating and it's so annoying. But the most important part uh, for the summary of this character and of this little episode is that Camilla dies on the battlefield from being distracted uh, by somebody's shining armor. And the guy who shoots her is this guy called Aaron's. But one thing that we hear Diana say as she's watching Camilla on the battlefield is that she says that even though she knows Camilla is destined to die here, that she is gonna be the one to kill whoever it is that kills her baby. And so therefore, when Camilla does fall by this arrow from Aaron's, that Diana actually sends her sentinel down, this woman called Opis, she sends Opis down to go and to hunt down Aaron's and kill him. And then that's exactly what happens towards the end of the book that you have Opis see Camilla die. She gets really upset and she sort of screams and she's like, Aaron's, where are you going? I'm coming down to kill you because Camilla will not die unavenged. So she starts running after Aaron's, like chasing him all the way down the battlefield and into the woods and all of this. And she has a bow and arrow herself because, you know, she's one of Diana's helpers and Diana uh, primarily hunts with a bow and arrow as a huntress, obviously. And so she goes into the woods and she then decides to shoot at Aaron's uh, at long range. But she's so good with her arrow that when she lets go, it is fired with such speed that Aaron's can actually hear it hissing towards him. But it hits him before he can actually deflect it. So he does end up dying on the battlefield. He is irrelevant. I'm only mentioning his name because he kills Camilla and Camilla means something to me. And so therefore he ends up dying in the woods and bleeding out. And we are told that uh, none of his men stop to help him, that he just bleeds out on the forest floor. Elsewhere on the battlefield though, everybody has noticed that Camilla is no longer with them. Camilla is no longer leading them. And this is also a testament to Camilla's character because all of them start panicking and in fact start retreating immediately. No Camilla, no fighting. I love that. So a bunch of them start retreating and actually as they all start retreating back into uh, the Latin city, a lot of them lose their lives along the way. A lot of them do get into the city, into safety, um, but a lot of them are killed as they turn around and they start running. But as that's happening, Turnus doesn't know that any of this has happened. My man is still in the forest, waiting at this weird little part of, <laughs> of the wood for Aeneas to come because he wants to ambush him. So that's where Turnus is right now, waiting for Aeneas. And along comes one of Camilla's mates, who is part of the story when Camilla falls over and she dies. This friend of hers, Akka, right, that's her name, A-C-C-A. -C -C -A. So this friend of hers comes over to her and she has this whole moment being like, oh, I'm dying or whatever. And Akka's like, no. And so that person, <laughs> that was a really bad rendition of that conversation, but Akka goes to find Turnus to 
tell him what's gone on. She mainly tells him of the panic that Camilla has left behind because none of them know what to do and how a lot of the men are losing their lives trying to retreat, which obviously triggers Turner to being like, what the f they can't be retreating that quickly just because Camilla's gone. And so he turns around to come out of the forest and as he's coming out of the forest, he actually catches sight of Aeneas and Aeneas catches sight of him and they have like this moment of being like, oh, I see you. However, and this is another really stupid storytelling point in my opinion. However, what happens is that they both realize, well, it's getting really late. It's kind of nighttime, so we should probably just do this tomorrow. And the fact that they both agree, there's like no conversation. It's just that they both sort of look at each other and then Virgil is like, well, they would have met in battle had it not been nighttime. So they both went to their respective homes and then they both fell asleep. And then that is the end of the book. Am I the only person that read that and was like, really, you could have settled that in probably like five, 10 minutes. Like we don't need to draw this out for another book. But Virgil being the storyteller that he is, is like, no, the darkness of night came. And it must've come really quickly because Turnus was fine in the forest, like not more than five seconds ago. I presume it was quite light at that point, but then he comes out of the forest, it's too dark to fight, and I'm like, just do it. But regardless, we are now at the end of the book. So we're now at the end of book 11. So all we have left is this showdown between Turnus and Aeneas uh, from the book, which will happen in the last book in book 12, which is uh, the next episode. That is the last episode of Virgil's Need, which is crazy. But I do just want to make a note again that with this book, with book 11, I did leave out a lot of detail and a lot of the narrative because again, it gets really hard with these books to summarize because I want to only mention things that you need to know in regards to a summary. And that is usually following the characters and the names uh, that you already know and that we've visited before. And there's no point of bringing up all of these new names, but um, you know, it's, it's getting increasingly difficult because these videos are kind of actually getting a lot shorter than I thought they would, which is a really wild thing. I thought we were gonna get longer and longer, but I just keep cutting out different names. I keep cutting out different characters. So just know that if you're reading this book and you're watching this video, I have cut out a lot. If you're a classicist watching this, if you're a classics teacher watching this going, wow, you left out a lot of things. I know, and I'm so sorry. I know what I've done. I know how much this is impacting the actual story itself. Um, but when it comes to summarizing, again, we have to leave out details, these details that are important in analysis, but are not important to the actual understanding of the story arc and the storytelling aspect um, of this book. So again, I'm aware and I wanna constantly make that very clear. These are summaries and I'm focusing on uh, only the things that I think as a classicist are the important things for an introductory uh, sort of, you know, moment to the Aeneid. So with all that being said, thank you guys so much for tuning into this video and we'll be seeing you next time. Oh my God, we'll be seeing you next time with the last episode in my Virgil's Aeneid uh, playlist. We'll be seeing you then.